Reporting in progress. Thank you, Sungu. Dear Madam Yobin Brad, Madam Teresa Jang, distinguished guests, dear fellow practitioners, Robert Trishun and ADR, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm addressing both your, those who are here in person and those who are joining us online. And a good morning to you. I want to say that it's great, me gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to our humble small office here. It's uh, small, but it's very compact, right? But then um, we have uh, only started it three years ago. And I explained to Anna, just, uh, we have not been very busy yet. You see, even if we started uh, accepting, uh, uh, persuading uh, corporate um, enterprises to include this arbitration institute to be their chosen uh, venue for settling disputes. It is only three years and uh, disputes have not yet arisen. There have been a few, but not a lot. But these premises have still been used extensively by various other overview of the arbitration cases and also being used by various organizations who need to organize seminars like this sort of nature. So we are not quiet. We have been using the premises quite extensively. Now, today, even though it is the first time ancestral SCIA and SCIA Hong Kong, um, the first jointly organized such a forum, uh, there have been, this three organization have been cooperating many times in the past, as so, and uh, as we're aware of. The cooperation, first of all, started in 2016 between SCIA and Uncitral, when SCIA introduced guidelines for the administration of arbitration under the Uncitral Arbitration Rules to facilitate parties' process. And as the first Chinese main organization to hear investor state arbitrations and handle disputes under Uncitral Rule, and SCIA make its first move. Then, Later in 2018, SCIA jointly held a seminar, the 60th anniversary of the New York Convention and the Belgian rule with the ancestral in Shenzhen. The seminar examined in depth the first arbitral award from Chinese meaning enforced in then, there is before the handover in Hong Kong. So the first mainland award being enforced was an award issued by SCIA. And so at the time, um, since then, it started uh, Hong Kong Shenzhen Arbitration Awards being enforced in Hong Kong, and the rest is now history, of course. In recent years, there has been increasing collaboration. For example, SCIA becomes exclusive organization for the qualifying tournament FDI moved to Shenzhen in Hong Kong from 2020 every year since then. Ancestral provides tremendous support, and Ms. Huben Brett also appreciates SCIA's contribution in cultivating international investment arbitration talents, as well as efforts in promoting international arbitration cooperation and exploring arbitration rule innovation. SCIA successfully joined Ancestral Working Groups 2 and 4 as an observer in 2022. And since then, I have to say they have taken personal interest following um, all your sessions, either in Vienna or in New York, and especially for the working group tools uh, sessions, which are dear to our heart, right, on arbitration and, and ADR. But also, of course, uh, working group six, which it was e-commerce, which is directly related to today's uh, topic. Um, so um, SCIA, uh, have been invited to participate in Uncentral's Investment Mediation Preparatory Forum and contribute our views, our insight in investment mediation. And also that, of course, we have to thank our former Secretary for Justice, Mr. Richard Chang's arrangement. I am delighted to see that all of you come here today to join us to take part in this important topic, this pill resolution in the Digital Economy Forum. This DRD year, right? this pill resolution in digital, uh, um, in digital economy. So DRD is the best word these days. And throughout the past two decades, our economy has been 
more and more digitalized, coupled with the advance of um, cloud computing, uh, IoT, AI, for example, and also the disruptive effect of the COVID pandemic that not only this disrupt, but the, of the opposite effect of actually accelerating the use of uh, technology and dealing with everything is electronic uh, these days. Uh, for example, in our SCIA case, according to our statistics, last year in 2022, out of the 8,280 uh, cases accepted by SCIA, 5,417 of them were filed electronically uh, initially. And of all these 8,208 cases, there are lots of um, filing, cross-filing of documents, uh, disclosure, uh, exchange of evidence, etc., all via online. And we have checked. And I must say that I have no idea why, how my people can work it out. I was told that there were 67,875 times of in, in, you know, interaction on, online. So there you are. Without further ado, it is it goes without saying that e economy is here with us. And because of that, you will have different types of disputes. And we do need to explore and take stock of what we have done in the past is um, are our, our arbitration rules uh, equipped to deal with the advance of the economy? We have some distinguished speakers who will share the wheels with us. I must say that I have um, really a absolutely star-stuck lineup today of speakers, right? A lot of them are my true idol, which I follow. Takashi Takashima is the excellent, perfect moderator. You will be, I think you should be called the one million, well, one billion dollar moderator. <laughs> <laughs> and you will, I, I can guarantee you that you will find this morning session most educating, entertaining, and very fulfilling. So enjoy the, the morning. Thank you, Chairman. I now have the great pleasure of inviting uh, the Secretary of Ancestral, Ms. Anna robin Brett, to deliver the opening remarks. Please, Madam Secretary. Thank you very much, Xiaoping, um, for the kind introduction and my thanks to Mr. Huang Wong, the Executive Chairman of uh, SCIA Hong Kong and Council Member of SCIA for his welcoming remarks. And please don't give any wrong ideas to my colleague Takashi because I want to keep him working with us for as long as we can. So no million dollars outside of the UN. <laughs> Greetings to all presents and to those joining us online. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, give my opening remarks to this forum uh, co-organized by ANSITRAL, by the South China International Arbitration Center Hong Kong and by SCIA, the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration. I would like to begin by thanking you very much for hosting this event. SCIA is an important contributor to ANSIFAL's work at the Commission and in the working groups. You mentioned your particular interest in our working group too, but I know that also in other working groups, we count on the active participation of delegates from SCIA. And we're very grateful that uh, SCIA and its sister organization, SCIA Hong Kong, uh, extends its support to ANSIFAL's work. I would also like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation and my friendly greetings to Dr. Xiaoshun Liu, President of SCIA and Executive Chairman of SCIA Hong Kong. Dr. Liu, I understand, is unfortunately unable to join us here today, but I would nevertheless like to acknowledge his efforts and his support in making this event take shape. Dispute resolution is one of the most important pillars of ANSITRA's work, not the only one, but uh, an important one. And with the support of the ANSITRA Commission and the endorsement of the United Nations General Assembly, the Secretariat has been implementing a project 
that brings us here today of stock taking developments in dispute resolution in the digital economy. And as you rightly put it, uh, the DRDE has become now an acronym that people begin to understand, unlike many other UN acronyms, which even we don't understand. Through the project, the Secretariat is exploring the impact of digital economy or digital technologies and technology enabled services on dispute resolution. Both new and conventional technologies and technology enabled services are being explored. They range from electronic communications, online platforms to artificial intelligence and the use of the blockchain. As Ancitral is a legislative body, the exploratory work is carried out with a view to either updating existing Ancitral texts or developing new ones as uh, the findings of the project will tell us. In taking this project forward, we reaffirm the need to reflect perspectives from different parts of the world in our work. And we have embarked, or Takashi has embarked, on an initiative called the World Tour. As part of this initiative to date, we have held discussions in Tokyo, New York, Guatemala City, Paris, Vienna, Abidjan, and Singapore. We are delighted to be able to hold this Hong Kong chapter of the World Tour together with our long-term friends of SCIA at the premises of SCIA Hong Kong. At its recent session in July this year, the Commission considered the Secretariat's first uh, intermediary report on the DRDE project, which contained an outline of the mapping exercise carried out and the preliminary findings regarding the legal issues, because that is what we're really looking into. What are the legal issues that arise from the use and involvement of technology? The commission expressed its strong support for the secretariat to continue its activities and to put forward concrete work proposals for its consideration in 2024 in order to develop norms fit for the digital age. We are committed to further implementing this important project, and we count on the support of contributors, including our Chinese colleagues and partners, to move it forward. Today, aptly moderated by my colleague Takashi Takashima, the million dollar moderator, <laughs> two panels will discuss relevant DRDE projects. The first panel will note, focus on electronic notices of arbitration, electronic arbitral awards. The second panel will explore issues on online dispute resolution and artificial intelligence, as well as discuss possible new steps for the project and Ancitra's work. I'm sure there will be a lot of food for thought and lots to draw from the discussions today as we inform the commission at its next session in 2024 on possible future work on dispute resolution. Adding my wishes to a fruitful discussions, with this, I conclude my remarks and hand over the baton to my dear friend, Teresa Chen, for her keynote remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Secretary. We are now moved to our keynote speech session. I now have I'm honored to invite Ms. Teresa Chen, SC, who needs no introduction to share her insights on this topic. Please, Ms. Chen. Good morning. Good morning, Anna, my good friend. Good morning, Hyun, also my very good friend, Takashi. Uh, good morning. And indeed, everybody here in presence here and, of course, those online. Um, I have to thank, first of all, Ancitra for inviting me to share this some thoughts. I am not an expert in this area, and therefore I raise questions rather than give answers. And I also have to thank SCIA Hong Kong as well as SCIA for uh, allowing me to giving me this opportunity to raise all the questions that I have in my mind about this very important and I think very hot topic that will continue to be with us for some time. And it is very high time that we grapple with it and make um, a good way forward. 
Now, the extensive use of technology in business transactions and expansion of e-commerce has sparkled demands for legal services that are unrestricted by cultural, geographical, and language boundaries over the years. Perhaps by reason of the pandemic, the way of life of people around the globe has changed. New business models and opportunities emerge. Digital economy has thrived and e-commerce has actually replaced a number of the traditional form of trading companies. In short, I'm saying that a number of these firms have actually had to close down or perhaps um, downsize their trading activities because of the growth of e-commerce. Uh, supply of goods from source to cons consumer necessitate a rethink of the old form of logistics and indeed documentations the bill of ladings and the insurance documentations that go with it. During the pandemic, a new form of social media has grown exponentially. To ensure that people remain in connection with each other, the use of short video on social media platform, the likes of TikTok and others, have become a way of life that has impacted many. They have provided links between people across the globe and ensure cross-cultural changes at a people-to-people -people level. It has created friendships and indeed with innovation, it has also created a new model of business, what is called live broadcast e-commerce, where people in the remote villages can actually via live broadcast promote and sell their products be they agricultural or handicrafts from their village. One must not un underestimate the importance of this mode of business. With the improved transport systems to remote villages built by government, for example, in China, the Chinese farmers and villagers have been able to change their fate and change their lives through improved living conditions and standards brought about by the income they generate through this mode of live broadcast e-commerce. An interesting observation uh, is that live broadcast e-commerce has in particular given women a much better chance and more opportunities than ever before in changing their lives and developing their businesses. Well, more importantly, actually, from China's perspective, it has in part contributed to China's achieving one of the goals of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, namely that of eradicating poverty. Now, this actually has also led to the development of an important area in recent times and which has escalated to its height as a result of the pandemic, and that is the use of technology in the provision of legal services. In 2016, the United Nations General Assembly observed that online dispute resolution, ODR, can assist the parties in resolving the dispute in a simple, fast, flexible, and secure manner without the need for physical presence at a meeting or hearing. The Asia Pacific Economic Co-op Cooperation APAC has responded to the call for more cost-effective and speedy form of dispute resolution and embarked on a project to establish an ODR pl platform with micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises as major beneficiaries. In April 2020, the APAC developed the collaborative framework on online dispute resolution of cross-border business-to-business disputes to help global businesses, in particular MSMEs, to resolve cross-boundary business-to-business disputes focusing on low-value disputes. ASEAN has similarly taken steps. The ASEAN Community Blueprint 2025 also highlights the development of a regional legal framework for ODL for facilitating e-commerce transactions with ASEAN. Here in Hong Kong, since 2018, we have pronounced a policy to develop and support law tech and have taken in a number of measures to that effect. 
to give an example, in 2018, eBrem has been established to provide ODL services to assist parties to resolve disputes via a secure and user-friendly online platform. To capitalize on the opportunities brought about by the international and regional developments, eBrem strives to provide an efficient, cost-effective and secure platform for online deal-making and resolving disputes amongst parties in any part of the world by integrating the state-of-the-art technology such as blockchain um, and artificial intelligence. The development of the eBrem platform in Hong Kong will not only facilitate deal-making and dispute resolution for global businesses, investment and trade, but also perhaps provide a valuable opportunity for Hong Kong to showcase its legal foundation and uh, its legal and dispute resolution professionals, but importantly, how the technology can assist uh, the legal services in prospering and also in serving the public. At this point, I must emphasize that online dispute resolution is not dispute resolution online. It is not merely the electronic filing via email and the use of video conferencing facilities for a hearing. ODR, I would think, properly understood, is an integrated end-to-end -end solution, which means that the entire dispute resolution mechanism, be they arbitration or mediation procedure, is digitally supported from submitting a claim to exchange of documents, holding a hearing to getting an arbitral award or settlement agreement. Online dispute resolution can perhaps be distinguished from merely using video conferencing app plus email because ODL should, in my humble view, um, offer a central repository for all the information communications, submissions, and evidence related to a particular case so that information is not mixed up with other emails or cases. There should also be an on-demand 24-7 video conferencing system, usually integrated with machine transcription and uh, translations so that there is no need to separate to, to separately engage multiple service providers each time a virtual hearing session is to be held, and perhaps also an integration with other tools such as online, real-time, editable, procedural timetable, machine documentation, translation facilities and capabilities, and of course, importantly, e-signature functions. As a lay person, I always look at it as an overall platform being a huge pie and the case being dealt with is like a piece of the pie and only the relevant parties can have a bite at it. Only they can access to that particular pie on the big platform. There should, be only, there should only be the one provider and is a self-contained system with automation that assists parties in conducting the procedure. In other words, I would think it should be a one-stop shop. Now, ODR is a process that utilizes technologies in a full spectrum of, OD, of ADL, ADL, Alternative Dispute Resolution Services, including negotiation, mediation, arbitration, and others. For example, Working Group 2 is looking at adjudication. So could there be some steps that can be done to bring about that is something that one can explore. ODR brings numerous benefits to the service users, such as enhancing access to justice by reducing costs for dispute resolution, saving time through simplified procedures and further upholding the neutrality of any third party mediator or arbitrator with no bias towards the ethnicity, the gender, physical appearance of the parties in a dispute. As stated, various international and regional organizations, uh, such as in fact, the uh, UNCITRA, the APEC, ASEAN, et cetera, are taking active steps to promote the use of ODL to provide a reliable and efficient platform to facilitate ADL. 
It is obvious that various attempts to promote the use of ODR by regional bodies and local institutions, in the light of all these, harmonization and modernization of the rules to ensure that the fundamental key elements of the rule of law are being observed become very relevant and indeed essential. Without such rules, it may be difficult to ensure that the product of the dispute resolution produced by such platforms will always be well respected and recognized. Legitimacy may of course also then become an issue. ODR is here to stay, and so is digital economy. Legal issues involved in ensuring that the dispute resolution mechanism using an ODR platform in such e-commerce transactions are plentiful. Fundamentally, one has to ensure that the due process of the procedures is observed. And this is where I start raising questions. Is the adoption of the sole protocol adequate? Is there a need to verify the right to be heard is protected? That the algorithm on an automated platform-based mechanism is fair and without bias. The need for confidentiality has to be well balanced against transparency in the development of the platform. Data security is pertinent when ODR is being adopted. Data storage and encryption measures may have to meet certain standards. Given it is online, do we deem a seat in the case of an arbitration by reference to the domicile of the platform provider so as to fixate an award to a jurisdiction for supervisory and enforcement purposes? Or should the platform be neutral in terms of its locale and leave the parties to continue to choose the seats? In the more day-to-day e-commerce uh, service providers such as Taobao, Alibaba, Amazon, etc. To use the app, as I'm sure you all have, uh, I certainly learned it very well during the pandemic when I cannot go out shopping. So I've learned how to use all these e-commerce providers. Um, you would always have to click consent before you can actually use the app. So in order to use the app, we always consent to whatever terms they set out for, otherwise you would be devoid of that opportunity. I wonder how many of us have actually scrolled through the terms and thought about clicking, and thought about it before clicking agree, uh, including lawyers. I'm sure even the lawyers would not have done that. Now in clicking agree, apart from the terms governing the contract that you've entered with this particular service provider, we have also agreed to the dispute resolution clauses. Should there be rules by which such platforms should observe in the dispute resolution clauses, or are they free to, and I quote unquote, impose such terms as they think fit? Are there no basic requirements that these platforms should adopt when they decide how we are going to resolve a dispute with them? When it comes to the NFT, the digital assets, or even cryptocurrencies, the issues become more complex. Not only would the IP right be a contentious matter, which will presumably be looked at by the working group four of UNCITRA in the substantive law matter, but may also uh, be, but may, but may, but perhaps we may also have some studies and guidance um, that should be carried out to harmonize such rules for dispute resolution in this emerging new economy and the dispute resolution mechanism that goes with it. With digital economy only, it, we may think that it has been around a long while, but I think not enough effort, if I may say, has been put forward 
to perhaps harmonize the various ways in which it is done. And if we are doing it, I think it is also time to think of what a lawyer will always tell a client. Think about what you're going to do when a dispute arises and put that together with the development of the digital economy. And that is why the DRDE becomes so relevant to our daily lives as well as the business as a whole. There is a lot to be learned and understood, and there is no better body than the Ancitra to take this up and set some guidelines or rules or minimum standards for these platforms to adopt so that international trade can continue to flourish in this new form of economy. With the great insight of Ancitra, and I must say Anna in particular on this particular point, steps have been taken to set up an expert group by which brains could be picked and through which we hope some rules for ODL can be established to support the sustainable and legitimate growth of ODL and DRDE. They are very much related, and but they can also be separate depending how it is going to be framed. But I would expect that for digital economy, I would probably expect that they would more be ODR form rather than the traditional physical meetings because uh, by reason of digital economy, people are dealing with everything through such platforms. Now on 2nd of November, 2020, the Hong Kong Department of Justice established, together with Ancitral, established the DOJ Project Office for collaboration with Ancitral. This was established in the Hong Kong Legal Hub, and it is established to provide support to the inclusive global legal innovation platform on ODR, IGLIP on ODR, and I call it IGLIP on ODR. This IGLIP on ODL composed of experts around the world to facilitate studies on ODL related issues internationally. I had the honor of attending the first meeting in March 2021. I highlighted at that meeting that IGLIP on ODL set, was set up to survey the ODL landscape, keep track of and study emerging technologies and how they influence and affect the ODL processes conduct in-depth analysis on potential issues that may arise and explore, um, discuss and develop innovative legal tools to address such issues. Ambitiously, it is hoped that this will contribute to the legal sector's response to the use of law tech in particular in the area of ODR. The Ancitral at its 54th session in July 2021 endorsed the suggestion of the Secretariat to continue to collaborate with the DOJ project office and to take part in the IGLIP ODL so as to utilize the expertise, resources and connections available to cooperate in promoting, raising awareness and capacity building in ODL. I am pleased to learn that there will be another meeting for ODR, uh, for IGLIP on ODR uh, tonight, and with the expertise and wisdom of the experts in the platform, the harmonization and modernization of rules for ODR and DRDE will no doubt benefit from such discussions. Looking into the future, I would expect that there would be platforms to develop smart contracts using the blockchain technology that would not only time stamps all transactions, but actually also to facilitate the negotiations on the platform so that the exchanges and meetings are recorded. Given the cross-border nature of e-commerce, the use of artificial intelligence to translate and perhaps also to transcribe discussions at online meetings will be most helpful. Chat room capabilities for exchanges in negotiations um, on all, uh, all the negotiations on the same recorded platforms will ensure a fair and complete understanding of the terms of the contract, thereby facilitating performance. And in the event of disputes, it will be resolved on the same platform as all negotiations and execution documentation would already be recorded in the platform, there is no need for discovery, except perhaps for some specific discovery for internal documentations of the parties. The process 
hopefully using a mediation as its first step before approaching to arbitration, would be no doubt conducted online and it matters not where the parties are located. And such a process, I think, will be most beneficial as it is affordable and accessible in particular to MSMEs and, of course, large businesses alike. Dispute resolution on transactions conducted through what may be called permissionless or public blockchain uh, could be more problematic. Doubts have been raised as to whether the connected dispute resolution mechanism is justifiable. It, the basic parameters must be developed by which the reliability and fairness of the mechanism can be measured. All these platforms must have some rules by which they are to operate. Broadly applicable principles to dispute resolution on online platforms and dispute resolution mechanisms on blockchain may be developed. To provide a good platform for law tech and ODR to, to develop, and this is how you perhaps um, thinking of how you are going to actually do it, uh, may I sort of boldly suggest um, learning from the regulatory sandbox model that is used in the financial industry when they develop when they are developing fintech. The Hong Kong SFC describes the purpose of their regulatory sandbox is that to ensure market integrity and better investor protection, the reliability of such financial services, as well as the platform operators internal control systems would need to be examined and monitored in a confined regulatory environment at the initial stage. The sandbox would enable the operators through close dialogue with and supervision by the regulator under the licensing regime to identify and address any risks or concerns re relevant to their related activities. Now, this is for the innovative um, activities that are going on in the area of fintech. Now, however, I must emphasize that given the lack of any regulate, regulators or any regulatory models, um, platforms using innovative technologies will be able to can adopt a sandbox and adapted way in which to exchange and improve whilst the rules maker can learn and fine tune the rules that should be applicable to the relevant law tech models, be they a specific thing for a digital economy or a dispute resolution mechanism. And that I think would be something you, one can adopt from the sandbox theory by refining and improving on the rules. Of course, not. I'm not suggesting a regulatory model, but I think I, we are looking at how to actually improve, I think, rather than that. Now, there is much to be explored and, uh, dis, uh, and to be discussed on this new form of dispute resolution for digital economy. The IGLIP on ODR will no doubt continue to act as a useful source of knowledge and information for the future work of UNCITRAL in this area. The Asian Academy of International Law will be pleased and honored to participate and contribute in the development of DRDE and hope that we can assist in this very meaningful and very uh, uh, important task that UNCITRAL is taking up. With that note, may I say thank you very much to all of you for your attention, and thank you, um, Anna and Hune. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chen. I believe that after listening to Ms. Chen's insightful sharing on this topic, we all may feel keen to know some of the answers to these uh, questions. Then, so we have uh, we are, we are have two panel discussions to further explore this uh, topic. And both of the sessions will be moderated by Mr. Takashi Takashima, the legal officer of the International Trade Law Division of the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs. I would therefore hand over the floor to Mr. Takashima, and also I would like to invite the first three speakers, Ms. Heidi Chui, Mr. Huang Yiming, and Professor Tang Zhen to join the discussion. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr.
Thank you so much, Xiaofen, and uh, good morning. Uh, I would also like to add my words of thanks to the welcoming opening and also the keynote remarks with so many questions for us to respond to. Uh, some, if not all, will be taken up during our panel discussions. I usually um, provide an overview about the DRDE project at the very beginning, but I think the remarks have made a perfect segue and we can go straight forward into the discussions. But before I do so, I also would like to thank SCIA and SCIA HK for hosting us here. I have been and I am really thrilled, excited to be organizing and also moderating this uh, session, the two panels today. Uh, I'm not so sure if I can live up to the expectation as a million dollar moderator. I only have a very low threshold of being a very smooth or at least being able to facilitate the discussion. But what makes, what probably gives me this impression that I am a million dollar moderator is that I always have an excellent lineup of speakers. <laughs> So with, without further delay, uh, I would like to proceed to the discussions. And But I think we still have time to maybe perhaps not introduce the whole background, but maybe at least explain, uh, put forward the functions of the excellent speakers we have. To my right, Heidi Chui, Ms. Heidi Chui, a senior partner, Albright Law Hong Kong office, LLP. Uh, to my far left, uh, Mr. Yuming Huang is Deputy Director, Research Department of SCIA. And to my left is Professor Tentang. I call her by, by the name Sophia. Uh, Professor Weistein, Wuhan University, Academy of International Law and Global Governance. So as my first speaker, I have this Heidi Tree. Heidi, uh, I hope you can start us with your discussion on electronic communication and arbitration and take us uh, further deeper into the topic of service of electronic of notice of arbitration, please, Heidi. Thank you, Takashi. And um, my name is Heidi Choi. It gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to share with you on this very exciting topic. And thank you, Teresa, for your very elaborate and very detailed sharing, because oh, after your speech, I think that I have nothing to share anymore. But I think that um, from, um, and before I begin, I would like to thank Ancetro and also SEIA and SEIHK for the invitation. And uh, a bit about myself, I'm an arbitrator and also I handled uh, ODR cases online. And I came from a background where I also assisted banks, including virtual banks, in their digital economy e-commerce. So every now and then I also encounter situations where these very exciting and uh, innovative ways of uh, service of documents, they are be, they will to be explored. And also we encounter differences and also encounter challenges, how we encounter them. And I think this is a very great floor for, um, for all the industry um, stakeholders to come together so that we'll be able to elaborate and we'll be able to explore and collaborate different ways to resolve uh, the, the issues. Now, the topic that I'm going to share is from an, um, Hong Kong's perspective on surface of uh, documents electronically and, ele and the electronic communications. So because of time, I would um, like to borrow the logic and borrow the wisdom of uh, Hong Kong court decisions and also and overseas uh, jurisdictions and how uh, they are trying to adopt innovative ways to resolve uh, issues in the digital economy and the challenges to bring about how to effect service on, uh, on some non-participating uh, participants. Now let's look at... Um, the traditional way. Uh, in Hong Kong, uh, under Hong Kong High Court rules, it is traditionally very paper-based um, means of service. When you initiate pro legal process, you will uh, naturally you effect service by way of um, service by registered post and service on uh, personally, and because you have to ensure that the defendant will get notice of the initiation of the legal process because this is the first very important step. And, and otherwise, and you also have to effect service on the party's legal representative. Alternatively, 
while uh, once uh, uh, the all the um, reasonable attempts have been attempted and you have ex exhausted reasonable means to get attempt to serve personally on the defendant, you also be able to apply to the call for substitute service order to serve uh, by alternative means. So, for example, by publication of an advertisement or newspaper, that sort of thing. And but recently. We have seen cases in which the Hong Kong courts have tried to adopt very innovative means to uh, effect service on um, parties. We, um, I have shortlisted three cases. The first case is um, in which the Hong Kong court has tried to effect service on um, defendants by way of um, social media, Facebook, private message. And in this case, the Zhuhai Gotak case, uh, the Hong Kong court. This is actually the paradigm shift because this is the very first uh, Hong Kong court case in which the, Kong, Hong, uh, the High Court of Hong Kong has um, remarked that um, because modern technology has already evolved to such a stage where it is safer and comparatively more secure to effect service electronically to bring notice of the proceedings to a defendant, to a party. So this is the first case um, which the court, High Court has allowed a service by way of Facebook private message through the Facebook platform um, to, um, to serve an injunction order. So the second case is about service by QR code poster on, on, on a public area. This is an airport authority case. Um, because of the bulky documents and because of the, uh, the nature of the proceedings, the High Court Court at the High Court of Hong Kong has also adopted um, very innovative means of posting up a QR code on a conspicuous place uh, in the public area. So the people will click on the scan the QR code and which will enable access to a link where the people um, the people will be able to download documents um, from um, the link. So that is a second innovative way. Um, the third case um, is actually the um, provision of a data room. It's also an, uh, the Hong Kong court's uh, innovative step to um, use a data room for the purpose of downloading documents from um, a, a specific data room. So these three cases all um, have shown the Hong Kong court's um, attempts to embrace digital economy, to embrace change. Now let's look at electronic service in other jurisdictions. So I have also, hand, uh, I have also picked three cases uh, in which um, courts in other jurisdictions have tried to uh, attempt by sur service of a uh, judicial process by text message. The first case is the English court uh, case in which an injunction order was served by way of a uh, text message. So this is um, and also and, and like Hong Kong courts, uh, this is also a very innovative way. And the second case is uh, the service of default judgment by way of Facebook uh, message. So this is um, like Hong Kong courts. Uh, we, we, it seems that um, um, the, the use of social media is something that um, we, will, we will encounter day in and day out. So this is a service of a default judgment. And the third case is service of an injunction order through a Twitter platform. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is this. Um, because of the unique nature of these proceedings, these proceedings all deal with uh, anonymous uh, defendants or that the, the, these defendants are hard to catch. They are um, probably from overseas, they are probably located overseas or you, are, you don't know um, their present whereabouts. So it is actually quite impractical to effect service by way of sending postal uh, through the traditional postal means. So, but looking, in um, other, um, you know, for perspective, and in the context of arbitration, because you you require a consensual process. So, how do we embed or how do we embrace this uh, digital economy and the use of social media in the form of ODR, in the form of our rules, in institutional rules to embrace change? Uh, like Teresa, and I've also looked at one case in which. This is a very novel form of electronic communication by, uh, by sending the NFT and dropping the NFT to the digital wallet of a crypto um, 
um, wallet of, of, a, of a defendant, of a respondent. So because of the unique nature of um, crypto exchange and, and, and trade in cryptocurrencies, so these are the very unique form of service in which uh, courts of um, overseas jurisdiction has, has adopted as a means of effective communication. So the magic word is to proper notice, right? So proper notice, how do we ensure that these mode of communications will properly bring uh, notice of proceedings to the recipients? So I think this is the million dollar question that we have to have, have to ask ourselves. Now, the practical consideration in the context of arbitration. Now we are all embraced, um, you know, the change, and also we all we all like to um, have a more speedy and and cost effective mode of communication. So. Uh, institutional rules have also built in some um, forms of electronic communications by way of email. But to my mind, uh, if I may say, we are still at a very rudimentary stage of this uh, development and only email form of communications uh, are embedded. Are we, in, um, are we in a way embracing social media changes and these other kind of e-platforms where we'll be able to build in and to expand the scope so that we'll be able to adopt different forms of e-communications? Now, speed and cost and also proper notice, they are paramount. But there are practical issues that we have to deal with in particular how do we deal with non-participating parties? So in my uh, practice, I've also come into contact, like Teresa have just shared, there are e-platforms where you have to click consent. And there are also, I've, I serve banks and, and also financial institutions where you subscribe to a service by logging into the mobile app. And in the mobile app, you have to fill out a form, you have to provide because of the KYC, you have to provide your email contact information and, and your correspondence address, your mobile number, and also um, your email address. But then many of these rules, they also provide for an opt-in for the mode of communication. Say, for example, you, um, the subscriber, they can opt for e electronic communications as the mode of communication. So in these sort of circumstances, do we automatically exclude service by way of correspondence? Now, uh, from a, a practical point of view, even for the, these, um, these, uh, these subscribers, the, um, of course, well, during the course of the transactions, perhaps for daily transactions and daily, um, daily uh, conducting of transactions, you will send a, a record of the communications, you set a record of the transaction immediately through the, through the preferred means of communications, say, for example, to send to their email addresses. But do we exclude the other forms? Are we safely assuming that um, they'll be able to receive it when they are not responding? So I think that it is very important for us to look for the rules and the terms and conditions, whether um, they have already embedded in these sort of circumstances, they, are, they have deeming provisions that say, say um, surfing um, notices and documents through their, um, through their stated email addresses will be deemed as proper notice of service, then they will be um, conclusive evidence. But questions, again, we ask questions. What if if how to ensure that um, there is proper delivery if they are not responding to the process. So you will ask yourself, as a matter of um, as a matter of tactics, as a claimant, would you ask for read receipt? Would you ask for delivery receipt? What if they are not reading, deliberately dodging service, deliberately just unread it? So you will get a you you get a message where well the respondents just not read. It's not read. So is that proper notice? So um, and whether we have a deeming provision like uh, that, despite they are not reading, so we still we still deem that as having notice. So that is the, that is the question. That is the million dollar question that every arbitrator or every participating parties, even the claimants and the parties advocates, we have to answer. Okay, and then and and also. If um, if expanding the the issues forward about the uh, about uh, about um, the uh, service by way of social media, how to verify their identity? There are so many fake identities. 
I myself, I just reported a, a fake website using my photo on, online yesterday. So because of, um, it's actually quite prevalent nowadays when, when you be, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, uh, scammers, they just take your photo and then they put on a web, um, fake website on Facebook and creating a, web, web, a fake website as a impersonating yours. So how do you verify identity? So if we want to explore means and ways to use social media like Twitter account and service by way of Facebook or even LinkedIn, how do we ensure that these are the proper respondents? They, they are authentic, they're legitimate. So these are the questions that we should ask. And due to the limited time, probably I'll stop here and, and let them um, and let Takashi ask a million dollar question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Heidi, and also for keeping with the time, which is always important in, in these kind of events. Uh, maybe I have time for one question for you. I hope it's a million dollar, or if not, a one thousand dollar question. <laughs> um, I think I think you already touched on this in your presentation, but I think, and also you mentioned at the very beginning that you practice as arbitrator, and from an arbitrator's perspective, with all these different means of electronic communication with mine. How do you ensure that the proceedings are not adversely affected by lack of power to notice in anticipation, as you mentioned, such as that the parties are not participating? How do you approach that as arbitrator? You said, talked a little bit about claimant side as tactics, but if you can elaborate a bit more on that, that would be great. Indeed, I think that is very challenging and sitting as an arbitrator, I'm sure that um, Teresa will have a lot of experience to share as well. And then from my perspective, I think that I will be extremely cautious if I deal with a non-participating party, especially. And I will look for um, the rules and also the terms and conditions to ensure that these individuals, they are, they are not participating, but then whether they have already agreed to a set of rules, where they be able to, uh, where the, the either the institutional rules provide for a certain uh, agreed mode of communications, and whether they have indeed consented to it. And in the absence of a positive response, uh, probably I'll opt for, um, I'll offer the traditional means of communication as well as the electronic means of communication as well. It is very, it is very risky to rely purely on electronic communications when you are provided for other correspondence address as well, and especially when the other party is not responding. I think the one one um, one caveat is that I would also ask the parties to come back to me as to whether the non-responding party has ever used email, that email address that he or she has provided as a medium of communication so that he has ever used. But the trouble is remains that if the party has never used, but it's just the receiving side of thing, then you have to be very cautious. So I think that um, this is something that we, um, the institutions would have to look after in the rules creation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. And I think we need to proceed to the next speaker. Resuming. But before I do so, I think I should also share that the DRDE findings show that the first phase in arbitration, uh, the notice of arbitration, and also at the very end, the electronic, the awards phase, they, they are the two phases that seem to remain permanently paper based. And I think this is an important topic so that we ensure the completeness of proceedings being conducted online. So I wanted to say this because Yiming is going to further discuss for us um, notices of arbitration, um, but his uh, discussion will be from SIAC's practice and experience and from that perspective. So Yiming, if you can start your discussion, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Takashi, uh, distinguished, <coughs> distinguished guests. I'm Yiming Huang from the Research Department and the Maritime Arbitration Center of Shenzhen's Court of International Arbitration. And it is my great pleasure to be here to give a briefing about our practice and experience on the electronic notices. So in our arbitration rules, Article 6, paragraph 2 provides that the institution can deliver the notices via electronic 
communications. And on the right is our interfaces for the parties and the secretarian, where you can see the delivery records of the electronic communications. And Article 6, paragraph 5 provides that it is within the discretion of the institution and the tribunal to allow parties to interchange uh, notices and documents via electronic data. Uh, however, in practices, the tribunal will make such procedure decision until they have fully consulted parties. In most of the cases, is in the first tribunal hearing. So before the first tribunal hearing, that, uh, for example, the notice of arbitration will be delivered via electronic notices and uh, hard copy deliveries. And also, uh, because most of our cases uh, have the seat in Chinese mainland and the Lex Arbitri is the Chinese arbitration law, so we will have uh, kept on reviewing our practices in the compliance with the Chinese judiciaries. And once such decision may, was made, uh, the secretariat will switching on the right interface to allow parties to interchange the documents. So you can see uh, on the below is a green button uh, switching on to interchanging function. So once the, this function has been activated, parties can interchange their files and documents. And currently, we allow parties to opt out the uh, click upside that's sending to other parties. So if the parties click off this bottom, the secretariat will have to double check. However, in future, we might, uh, as our practice improve, uh, we might not uh, enable parties to click off this bottom. And therefore, all of the other documents, except for the appointment of arbitrators and the application of interim measure will be uh, sent to the secretariat first. However, apart from these two documents, all other documents will be served via interchanging a system automatically. And therefore, it is the party's duty to sort out and classify what kinds of documents they are going to send before uploading a submission. And here's our reminder for the parties before the submission of the electronic documents. And uh, once the documents was electronically sent through our arbitration online platform, then the documents data will be sent via different electronic communication means, including emails and uh, WeChat apps. So WeChat is uh, a messaging and calling app covering most of the population of China. And of course, if for the parties abroad or the parties who don't have a WeChat account, uh, the Electronic notices will be served via emails. So uh, basically, it's a one shop uh, electronic noticing system. Uh, of course, it is commonly thought that electronic noticing have many advantages, including cost saving and efficiency. Uh, however, we will always be very cautious and prudent regarding on electronic notices in compliance with the requirement and our observation from the Chinese uh, judicial supervision from the Chinese judiciary. So basically, we have found some recent cases. And uh, in practices, to claim it because they have to register an account on our, on our arbitration platform first before filing their claim. So basically, they are definitely able to receive uh, electronic notices. So to claimants, we will serve them via electronic notices only, uh, except for the final word if they're asking for a hard copy one. However, to respondent, we have to acquire a very concrete confirmation for them. Uh, even if there is explicit agreement in advance in the contract that the parties agree on a specific email address to receive litigation notices, uh, we will wait until a written confirmation from the respondent. Uh, and for the respondent abroad, we will wait for their written confirmation or their engagement of a privacy council. So basically, as Heidi said, we are very cautious about the respondent in absence. And uh, if it's uh, a word by default, 
it will be very, very cautious regarding whether it will be supervised and reviewed by the Chinese judiciary. So basically those are uh, uh, three cases we found in public sources. And uh, first of all, please allow me to give you a small introduction regarding on the uh, Chinese judicial system on setting aside and refusal to enforce arbitration awards. Uh, so basically, the ruling to set aside or refuse to enforce arbitral award, a uh, domestic arbitral award, uh, the jury is lies in the intermediate people's court, which is the municipality level. However, it has to be approved by the high people's court, which is the provincial level. And uh, the ruling to refuse to enforce a foreign award under New York Convention or refuse to enforce any awards uh, based on the legal ground of public policy have to be approved by the Supreme People's Court. So these three cases are contemplated at least by two different levels of courts. So basically uh, the first one, the Jilin cases, it indicates that the arbitral institution cannot serve electronic notices via a QR code or access link. <clears throat> it's basically indicated that the full text of the uh, notice had to be shown visibly and directly for the respondent. So basically uh, in SCIA, we will serving our uh, crucial notice, including the notice of arbitration, the notice of the institution of tribunal, a notice of tribunal hearing uh, in a way that the full text of the notice had been fully shown. And uh, uh, the, sec the next and the second cases uh, indicated that there is a specific burden for the arbitral institution uh, when they are serving the case and notices by electronic communications. Uh, the second one indicated that uh, basically you can't just rely on the email address provided by the claimant unilaterally. And the second one is that it is within the burden of the institution uh, to ascertain whether such uh, email address unchanged in the contract concluded in advance. So basically, it means that there is a specific burden for arbitral institution and therefore SCI will wait until a very concrete confirmation come from the respondent so that we will continue our uh, services and delivery through electronic notices. And the last one is the uh, a ruling from the Supreme Court's court refused to enforce uh, ad hoc uh, maritime arbitral awards. Well, basically the Supreme Court's court believes that uh, electronic notices has not been precluded by Chinese law uh, and it is reasonable. However, that it is within the burden of the applier for enforcement to prove such electronic notices has been properly served and received. So basically it's a, a proven uh, burden and obligation for the applier to, to prove that the notice has been received. So basically, uh, even if uh, the party has concluded a contract containing a specific email address, uh, it has to be contemplated that such email address can be uh, in a way that parties can find whether such uh, notices or or any other documents serving can be uh, sorted out and uh, proven. Uh, so basically that uh, we, SCI is keeping on reviewing our practices in the compliance with the practices of the Chinese judiciary. And of course the courts are still very open-minded and uh, keen to promote electronic notices. Well, however, and of course they have rendered some guidance or guideline, uh, but SCI is always very cautious and prudent regarding non-electronic notices. So basically, uh, in short, I believe our practices can be uh, concluded as we believe such co uh, consent to accept electronic notices uh, have to be made during the arbitral proceeding, but not in advance. And therefore, uh, even if that the parties may conclude some contract providing a specific email address for contact 
or even specifically concludes that such email address can receive litigation notices or even uh, invoking the rules or uh, of our arbitration. However, uh, probably we are still practice our uh, arbitral proceeding organization in a way that in compliance with the uh, Chinese judiciary rather than reaching to the boundary of the discretion empowered by our rules. So basically that's our uh, practice and experience. And that concludes my uh, presentation. And thank you, Takashi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yiming. Uh, your presentation was really fascinating. And uh, I thought, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I, I think the Chinese courts take a very cautious approach towards using electronic means, especially for notices of arbitration, which is probably a reflection that the courts take um, the respondents' um, right to be heard very seriously. Uh, and I think you mentioned that SCIA, in line with that approach, takes a very cautious approach and requiring a confirmation of the notice of arbitration by the respondent in order to proceed with electronic means. But uh, has that approach been made publicly available? The reason why I'm asking is that have you has SCIA been carrying out some kind of study or any work uh, so that it develops and makes publicly available its guidelines or, or is it its own approach towards uh, servicing electronic uh, notices of arbitration, if you can respond. Uh, of course, it's on our approach. We will have some uh, internal guidance for the secretaries to conduct uh, electronic notices and deliveries. And basically, however, because the uh, judicial practice develops from time to time, so basically, if there is some uh, uh, negative ruling or judgment from any specific Chinese courts, uh, we will always uh, look into our practices. And as I said that uh, the competence of setting aside or refuse to enforce lies in different regions of the Chinese courts. So basically uh, the consequence may differ from regions to regions. Uh, so basically we, are keep contact with the uh, High People's Court of Guangdong province and to make sure that at least uh, it cannot be easily set aside. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it seems like the studies are kept internal for internal purposes, but yeah. to the extent you can, if you can keep us updated, we're always here yeah. to learn about Chinese courts. So with that, I would like to conclude your discussion for now, and okay. I would like to proceed to Sophia. Thank you, Takashi. So, Sophia, uh, you are going to discuss for us legal issues uh, and the prospects of electronic awards, as I mentioned earlier, the last phase that remains paper-based. And to set the scene, I would like to discuss, for you to discuss uh, how court proceedings in China are digitalized and, it are, and to respond to my questions, are judgments electronic rather than electronic form, please. Okay, uh, I actually prepared a very simple slides, but I don't know why this cannot be changed. Oh, it's here. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, basically, I have to say that China is doing very well in digitalization of court proceeding. Uh, but one area that developed relatively slowly is digital judgment. China did not allow digital judgment until quite recently. So on 1st of January, 2022, China has changed the law. So the new civil procedure law, and that is the law we're using now, eventually allowed the judgment to be digitalized. So it says judgment can be delivered electronically. So that implies it has to be digitalized, uh, but there is a precondition the precondition is parties have to give consent. So my presumption is China was very reluctant to digitalize judgment because it's one of the most important legal documents. And when parties uh, successfully received it, so that is it served successfully, and uh, generally it uh, will um, become effective after a period of time. And if the uh, respondent wants to appeal, the time started to cl click. So it is 
uh, quite important to make sure it is served successfully and the parties receive notice, but there is uncertainty whether digital notice can reach the party successfully. But now the things changed and I believe that is one of the consequences of the pandemic. Um, and of course, Chinese law also clarifies when a digital uh, judgment is successfully served. So it says parties have to give consent. And when if giving consent, they provided their address. So in that circumstance, it was served successfully when the judgment reached the system. So reached the electronic system, regardless whether you read it. And then if you did not provide the court your address, then it is served successfully if you respond. So respond means if defendant appeal, for example, or uh, if they really act according to the judgment. Uh, and then another proof is if your system provide evidence that they have read it. So sometimes electronic judgment is served by sending a text message to your mobile and then you click by reading and the system will record it. And also a lot of courts will just give you a phone call and ask whether you received the judgment. So there are a lot of ways to prove whether you received it. Another problem with digital judgment is originality. But then Chinese law is very clear and very clever. They avoid the originality problem. They just say, if we can reproduce the data identical to the previous data, so that it is well recognized, it has the same legal effect. So it avoid the problem of originality because we can't say for computer science whether a digital document is original or not. So that is not a concept we are using. So um, we have to say a lot of Chinese courts uh, did this very well, especially internet court and the mobile court. They digitalize most of their judgments. And for local courts, the process differs. So like Shenzhen, they did very well. They also use electronic judgment in most circumstances, but in many other courts, they are very slow. Thank you, Sophia. And my next question following the judgment would be obviously be about enforcement. And I would like to know about, about whether uh, Chinese enforcement proceedings are digitalized. Okay, uh, so for the enforcement, we will say it is one of the most difficult issue in Chinese legal practice. And uh, one major reason is it's hard to search your assets if the defendant hide it. And also for the physical enforcement, it will spend a lot of time and efforts. And now Chinese Supreme Court have made two uh, measures, developed two systems. The first one is the information sharing system. And for this system, it connects the court with a uh, public security service, with uh, aviation, department and uh, railway uh, corporation and a bank and other housing department. Uh, if a person refused to enforce, the court is going to search the information and find, oh, you really have a capacity to enforce, then the court will list this person as dishonest person, then every department will jointly penalize the person for the credit punishment. For example, the uh, L aviation department will refuse him from buying the L tickets and the bank will refuse the loan. So that is one way for enforcement. The second way is to establish an enforcement command system. And this system also connects all the department and the ministries as well as banks. And for this system, the enforcement officer can just log in to check the information, find out the uh, respondent's bank account and then send the electronic uh, enforcement order and uh, assistant order as well as his ID that can be scanned and send it to the relevant bank and the bank is going to help the court for enforcement. So that is also very easy because someone may have accounts located in different provinces in China, different branches. And when doing so, you can help enforcement very conveniently. Okay, but the problem Practical problem is not all courts join the system because the local courts have to meet the security standard of Supreme Court in order to join. Some local courts do not meet the standard, so they cannot use the system. Okay, thank you, Sophia. And we've heard about electronic judgments and now about electronic enforcement proceedings. But we're here to discuss uh, arbitration and specifically arbitral awards. So. What are the issues that may arise if we were to consider enforcing electronic arbitral awards, please, Sophia? Yeah. Uh, 
I'm very surprised to see that many judgments are actually digitalized, but very rarely we see purely digitalized arbitral awards. <laughs> That's because uh, there is always concern of formality of arbitral awards, and uh, people worry formality may prevent awards from being enforced. Uh, formality basically includes four matters. The first is a lot of countries' domestic law require arbitral awards to be in writing. And then they previously believed in writing should be the paperwork. But uh, uh, we say nowadays many countries have updated their law and also on to provide a model law suggesting we use a functional equivalent approach. So if digital uh, paper, uh, the digital work could meet the functioning of writing, that is it provide accessibility, provide sustainability, provide accuracy, it can be regarded as in writing. So the second problem is many countries will require signature of arbitrators. And the signature in the past also include the written signature, handwriting one. Uh, but also we suggest we use functional equivalent approach such as unsuitable um, model law says, and also Chinese law also provide. If uh, an electronic means to sign can prove the identity of the person who signed and also prove his approval to the context. So that means it is equivalent to um, handwriting signature and it should not be a problem as well. So the third issue of um, formality is originality again. Um, we look at the New York Convention. New York Convention says if a person want to apply to enforce and recognize arbitral words, he have to supply authenticated original copy or a certified copy. But it does not mean definitely we need original copy because in computer science, we don't have the concept of original copy. So a certified copy should be fine. Uh, and, uh, and the thing is, we are not very sure about authenticated. So in the past, a lot of arbitral institution, they will put a stamp on the arbitral words to show this is authenticated. But now what they can do is they have to use the electronic seals and they use the electronic stamps to prove and authenticate. And whether or not this should be recognized by an every country's domestic law is a question. And finally, it's communication, because just now, uh, two colleagues already discussed the notice. I'm not going to say that in detail. So that is the formality problem. People always worry because of the requirement of formality, arbitral awards made electronically will have the risk not being recognized, and they don't want to take this risk. So because of the risk approval process, nearly no arbitral institution want to use electronic arbitral awards. Okay, thank you, Sophia. And in your view, how do you see the process, prospects of enforcing electronic awards? Um, I, actually, there is a very good researcher. He did a, a very comprehensive research. And this research have listed a lot of items. They ask an arbitral institution to compare between electronic awards and the paper awards. And basically most respondents agree that electronic awards have the advantage of speed and low cost convenience and environmental friendly. And they have uncertainty as to integrity. Yeah, because they worry that electronic awards may be easily modified and altered or fabricated. Uh, so um, normally half people believe it is more user-friendly to use the electronic one and the others, especially old fashioned, they want the paper one. So for those, generally it's quite similar. Um, and my perception is that I believe arbitral awards made electronically can be cheaper uh, and can be much faster. But so of course, this to arbitration institute is just a, a number of few days or hundred US dollars less to post that paper copy. And they don't want to risk for arbitral awards not being recognized. So for me, actually, the biggest problem with arbitral awards made electronically is the enforceability. Yeah, so if the legal 
we, we can legally remove the obstacle of enforceability, make it clear that it can be enforced, no problem at all. I believe it can be the trend in the future and the more and the more year awards will be made. And also I want to say a little bit about integrity. We always worry year awards is not, is very easy to be fabricated and modified than paper work. But actually I know that in the past, um, it happened one time. I know in China, a lawyer have made a fake judgment, that's paper judgment, and give it to his client just to police client said you win. Actually, he lost. So even paper judgment can be fabricated and faked. And I don't think e judgment, e awards is worse than that. And actually, if you use the modern technology, use the right one, it can be even safer, provide a higher standard of security. For example, the e cells, they provide a barcode or a QR code. If you scan, you can very easily verify whether the judgment, or whether award or judgment is right or, or the, 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 the authentic one or not. And also some e-awards can be made by using the blockchain. So it is the highest standard to show the security. Any fabrication can be identified. So I don't think integrity is really a problem of e-awards. And I believe that is a misunderstanding. All right, thank you, Sophia. And finally, could you share with us your views on ancestral undertaking work on electronic awards? Uh, as just now I said, uh, the real obstacle of e-awards is the uncertainty and the risk associated with uncertainty. And the uncertainty is the un uh, clarity of the law. So if Ancitra really take the work to make it very clear, provide such as model law to the rest of the world, showing they believe uh, year awards, if meet certain standard, that can provide a security, can protect the party's right to know, so provide the right notice, uh, it is uh, valid. And there is no problem as to originality or something like that. We don't use this concept anymore. Uh, and I believe it can really help uh, year awards from being used in the future. And probably you can also add something. For example, if parties want to use year award, they should give consent. So this party autonomy also provides protection to parties' uh, procedural rights. Okay, thank you, Sophia. That was a, that was a really great uh, a lot a lot to draw from your discussion. Thank you. Thank uh, you. So with this, we conclude the first panel. So I pass back to Xiongfei. Uh, thank you, Mr. Takashima and the uh, three panelists of our first panel discussion session. Thank you. We will, we will now take a very short break and prepare ourselves for the second uh, panel discussion. Please feel free to, to take a break, grab some drinks at that room, and we'll be resumed very shortly. Thank you.
May I now invite Mr. Takashi Takashima and our three other panelists, Professor Professor Zhao Yun, Mr. Zhang Lixing, and Professor Shala Ali to take a seat at the stage and start the second panel discussion. Okay, thank you, Xiongfang. Uh, so now we resume with the second panel. And so we have as, a, as our first speaker for the second panel, uh, Yun Zhao. But before I go ahead, I think it would be important that I introduce uh, H3 speaker. Yun Zhao is a professor at the University Hong Kong University, and Shala Ali, uh, professor also at the Hong Kong University, and also uh, Li Xingzhang is uh, with the uh, uh, chief of legal lab, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> and uh, he is heading the initiative on the technological development with SCIA. So we have three excellent speakers for our second panel. And I would like to pass the floor to Yun to discuss for us uh, the regulatory framework on ODR, please. Uh, thank you very much, Takashi. I think good morning, everyone. Uh, I think it's a great pleasure to be here. And I also would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to uh, do the sharing. Uh, ODR, of course, I think very important topics nowadays. Uh, with the excellent keynote speech, I think by Ms. Teresa Chen, I think this make, make my job even more difficult. <laughs> As, uh, as I also will also touch upon some of the issues that she has also covered. Uh, so, so I think uh, ODR, as I mentioned, ODR de developed very quickly with the technological development. I still remember when I first picked up the issue on dispute resolution in e-commerce uh, in 1999, at the time, uh, uh, the e-commerce or internet development was still at early stage. Uh, I had also picked up the issue for my PhD research at the time, uh, but we know that uh, not many, much research uh, or much development at the time. Uh, and also the domain name dispute resolution mechanism has just introduced in 1999, or October the 24th, 1999. Uh, so it's a starting point. Uh, in the early stage of the development of ODR, it was not very successful because in 1995, when the International Society looking to possible uh, use of the internet to facilitate dispute resolution, the United States has, well, there are two universities in the United States already has done some experiments, but these two experiments all uh, died down within two years time. But fortunately, thanks to the introduction of the domain name dispute resolution uh, mechanism, this has been considered to be one of the most successful examples of ODR. Uh, so uh, after 1999, we can see the ODR continue to, to develop, but there are still some difficulties or barriers for the acceptance of ODR. Again, I think with uh, uh, COVID-19, it provides an excellent opportunities for us to look uh, how to push forward ODR. I still remember when I received some arbitration cases uh, during uh, 2019 to 2020, uh, several cases were conducted online. So online hearing has been introduced, but we know that ODR is not talking about the use of the internet as, uh, uh, well, use the uh, uh, internet for uh, online hearing, uh, but it can include much more. Uh, but at, at least uh, COVID-19 provides impetus for, our, uh, for us to understand what is ODR and how to use ODR and a wide use of the ODR, things that have become very important issue. Uh, and also at this point, there are some discussions, probably for wide use of ODR, we need to come up with a regulatory framework. Regulatory regime is so important for the, uh, the ODR. Uh, so we can see the definition was provided actually by the Ansitra ODR technical notes. Uh, the concept 
is very broad. Basically, means if you use uh, the technology, information uh, communication technology, that means uh, something uh, uh, related to ODR. So that's a starting point. Uh, but of course, I should mention about the uh, first efforts or initiative of um, regulatory uh, regime is done by the UNCTRA. Uh, after six years of efforts, we, uh, we have uh, seen the adoption of the UNCTRA uh, technical notes on ODR. Um, this technical notes, uh, of course, are very, very important. It provides a guidance regarding the use of online negotiation and online mediation. But unfortunately, because of the divergent views between the European Union and also the United States regarding the pre-dispute uh, arbitration agreements, uh, so, so the, agree uh, the technical notes fail to include the online arbitration. Uh, this is a very important development, but again, I think we find out there are still some problems, some uh, things we, we need to, something uh, we need to do uh, further. So the APEC rightly picked up the issue, uh, continuous work. Uh, as uh, Ms. Chen has mentioned, uh, APEC uh, negotiation, uh, very important and very successful. The Hong Kong government has taken a very important role in the negotiation process. Um, Japan, uh, the United States, and Hong Kong, China, the three economies uh, actively participated in the negotiation of the APEC. Uh, APEC uh, has, of course, a very good leverage uh, because the European Union is not part of the APEC. So during the negotiation, there are a lot of issues regarding how to frame the negotiation process, how to come up with a good uh, scope uh, for the doc future documents. So they look into possible angle. Uh, as the mission also mentioned, the documents basically looking to MSMEs. Uh, so it's a small uh, company, it's a medium-sized company or micro uh, companies. Um, according to one review, uh, survey, uh, yeah, around the year of 2017, 2018, the survey shows that more than 99% of the companies in the APEC economy uh, belongs to MSMEs. Then another survey also shows that more than 30% of the MSMEs believe that the dispute resolution proves to be a barrier for the survival of uh, MSMEs. So that's why there's a need to come up with a legal regime to push forward the use of uh, ODR for MSMEs. Uh, with this as a, um, a basis, the um, MSMEs uh, also participated in a negotiation. Uh, they believe that the future collaborative framework should work very well for the introduction of uh, negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. And probably in the future, we're also looking to uh, B2B and B2C. Of course, the current stage, the documents or the collaborative framework that were adopted in nine, uh, 2019 basically deals with the B2B uh, disputes, not yet touching upon the B2C. Uh, so through th three years of negotiation, the APEC was able to adopt the collaborative, uh, collaborative framework and also uh, the procedural rules for the ODR. Uh, it includes the negotiation, mediation, and arbitration through this process. Uh, at the moment, the Hong Kong, China, Japan, the United States, uh, Singapore, uh, and mainland China. So the five economies has opted in in the collaborative framework. Uh, this year, we also uh, do some capacity buildings in other economies within APEC. It appears that the sixth economy might be uh, opt in. I think that will be the, the uh, Indonesia. So I think these are the uh, first developments. But another very important initiative by the APEC is the adoption of the study on the best practice in using of ODR. This is uh, the very important step in furthering the regulatory regime for ODR. The document uh, was adopted recently, early this year. It touched upon various aspects. First of all, it encouraged the members' economies to use the ODR. It believes that it's very important to have an ODR platform to deal with ODR. Furthermore, it also touched upon several uh, general principles regarding the use of ODR in setting up the ODR framework, in setting up the ODR platform. So there's some guidelines there. Yeah? Uh, apart from APEC, I should also mention about the HCCH before I look at the International Standard Organization. Uh, 
uh, during the um, discussions in the HCCH, uh, that's a project regarding the cross-border tourists project. They believe that ODI is very useful in resolving cross-border uh, tourist uh, disputes. Uh, in the very beginning, they were thinking, oh, we should, well, in a way, very ambitious to come up with a conven binding convention or, or at least a protocol. But unfortunately, through years of negotiations, they decided um, it's not viable to come up with a binding document. So uh, they decided on to uh, the adoption of a, a guidance or soft law documents regarding the, uh, OD, the use of ODR for cross-border tourists. So that's uh, uh, something I would like to add in. For the international standard organization, I think that's another very important effort. They are looking to possible legal regime regarding uh, the regulation of ODR and to push forward the use of ODR. So uh, this uh, uh, in, uh, project is still under negotiation, under discussion. Uh, it is intended to provide some guidance for the users or consumer, consumers uh, in the use or the adoption of ODR. Um, the other body, which also has done some work, I think actually even earlier than the uh, ANSI trial, is the International Council for ODR Standard. Uh, it, the principles that we put on is rather general. It uh, provides that ODR platforms and processes must be accessible, accountable, competent, uh, confidential, equal, fair, and impartial, legal, secure, and transparent, etc. And now I would like to touch upon the Chinese efforts. Uh, in the last two or three years, China also has a, a step up in making some standardization of standards. So two very important documents were adopted regarding the use of uh, ODR and also the uh, ODR in e-commerce. The document itself basically uh, deals with uh, the guidance for the overall process involves the ODR, the platform access process, the application submission process, the dispute resolution process, et cetera. Now, as a uh, professor has mentioned that, uh, that's a, a, I quote from a professor, basically the mentions that a clear standard or definition of ODR and also standard is rather useful and very helpful for the wider adoption of ODR. And we believe that uh, uh, further efforts on the regulatory regime construction will be uh, uh, of uh, vital importance. So with this, I would like to conclude that an ODR framework will provide a rule-based ODR framework to ensure the healthy development of ODR. It will also provide MSMEs a very viable ways to um, seek redress, uh, uh, redress, and also it will help to add access to justice. Now, of course, we are talking about the access to uh, digital justice. So thank you very much. Thank you, Yun, for the excellent presentation. And I think you mentioned towards the very end of your presentation about the Chinese efforts to come up with standards. So if I may ask further, uh, I would like to ask if the effort in China was made um, in response to a particular concern or issues, or was it more of a proactive issue, a proactive um, effort made uh, by, by the authorities? Here in, uh, in China. If you can give us a little bit more background, that would be very nice. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, ODR development uh, was very rapid in the last few years, actually, in mainland China. We are not only looking into the arbitration, online arbitration, actually, we also introduced the internet court. So to respond to your question, I would say it's more of a proactive attitude regarding the, standard, the standardization issue. Uh, we can see that China has been uh, actively participated in the uh, regulatory efforts for the adoption and the wide use of ODR. Uh, with the uh, ODR uh, standards, we um, expect that a, a, a more consumers and parties will be willing to use ODR, and this will also be a very important way to win the trust and confidence uh, from the consumers. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we also know that there's also interactions between the international regulatory efforts and national regulatory efforts. So um, uh, China uh, would like to also make some efforts to show to the outside world regarding the standardization issue in China. And uh, so this will be the process of a transplantation and also uh, try to show the Chinese position on the same issue. So I would say this is a proactive attitude regarding uh, 
uh, so the regulatory efforts from the China. But of course, I think through all these years, China also witnessed uh, success and the failure of the ODR. So that they have also realized quite a lot of problem in the use of the ODR. So in a way, it's also the, some reflection of the Chinese ways to resolve certain issues in the ODR. That's great, Yun. Thanks so much. And now we move to Li Xing, who will be discussing for us the application of chat GPT in the field of international arbitration. Please, if you would like to use the podium, please. Please, along with the please, chat. please do. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me do the fun part of the program. Uh, it's, uh, you know, online and electronic is ever I put a new topic, not the FTT. So how to talk it? Yesterday, Sam Edelman just announced the PPT for purple. Very powerful. That are in the interest everybody. <laughs> no exception for our legal profession whatsoever. So this is a big topic. Uh, I will do quickly because of my slides is pretty, it's pretty, so everybody not feel boring, okay? Get used to this one so that no me. Yeah, this is my outlet. Very big. So I will do very quickly, okay? This is really a disruptive technology today. It's an AI revolution. I don't know how many, how many people are using that right now. Can you? Oh my God, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tomorrow I will never give a talk for Shenzhen Bar Association. A lot of law firms invite me to give a talk. Very few people are using that. It's very difficult in China to use real, real chat GPT, okay? You guys are very fortunate. We started like, uh, you know, like uh, up ago, we started doing that with uh, SIC. We do a lot of work in the six years. We're moving forward, okay? This is really a starting point. So artificial intelligence is a very interesting concept, actually from ancient Greek. The ancient Greeks think about can make a machine they can see. So uh, after that, I'll be tooling, tooling the first paper titled, Can Machine Think? He passed away uh, very earlier. That's before computer was born in 1946 in Nika. So uh, after that, that would be the Davos conference. The artificial intelligence term is for, is really used. The first time used by Mikasa. Uh, that's a very good conference. After that, after go in 2006, when I retired from uh, from Costco as a general counsel to doing uh, AI. So we work with uh, SASC to do that. Artificial intelligence, really a very challenging and, and very useful, useful tool for lawyers, for everybody. But you know, the only can do after go is the open source. They can only do a very specific thing. But ChatGPT can do everything now. They already last year, November 30th, this time over 200 you know million people using that right now changing is a conventional robot approaching the human intelligence just like us very smart and bill gates said it's a third class internet and iphone dr kissinger is 100 years old now he used that last year he said, this is like a, another scientific enlightenment in human history Remember the first one? First one is the late 17, early 18s at like Newton. Bacon, Bacon, Bacon is a lawyer. And they started an industrial revolution.
solution for that, you know, after, after that development. Because we're a very smart person. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the this is the key term, key team who doing that. This is very smart. All these people only have eighty seven people. They create the history. The average age is just under thirty. Very interesting. All my users of my legal DPT is also the under thirty so young people. So I found the market will be those young people, young legal professionals. That's the history. Company set up in 2015. Uh, they put in a five billion US dollars. Sam told, told the people they will need 100 billion dollars to do the, the real, real artificial intelligence. You look at the website, they say, we are working for the AGI. AGI is like us, okay? Uh, in US, it's a landmark for for the generative AI firms. Uh, but only three, three companies, Google. Google left behind. Uh, OpenAI is the first. And also Anthropic, Cloud. I use Cloud every day because it's very good for lawyers. You can load down all your files, talk to them, then they give you the answers and give you predictions and also drafting the applications, arbitration of both in, in a few seconds. Very amazing. Uh, in the legal circle, there's a PISTEX, uh, Harvey. PISTEX is created by few Sanford law graduate. I'm using that every day right now. It's very, very good. But unfortunately, you cannot access from China. Mm. And the second one is Harvey. Harvey is created by lawyers from California. They have not released anything right now. But the waiting list is crazy. It's about over 20,000 with people on waiting list, but they have not delivered anything yet. Okay, uh, that the structure of TGTP is not that hard, three steps, but the engineering is hard. So we say this is the engineering victory to create a very good tool for everybody, including legal professions. Uh, I will talk about it in law school for two hours, but I'm not go going here, it's very detailed. TCTP is what? It's a, it's a large language model. They learn everything and they can predict everything. For lawyers here, can train the legal knowledge. Statutes, I put statutes, I put the cases. Unfortunately, uh, the, artificial, the, the arbitration cases are confidential. I, can't put, I cannot put it on. If I put it on in one second, okay, one day, people, arbitrators, all the councils can use that. Very efficient, okay? And they're not just the text generator. They can predict the case. That's my favorite. They have a, they have a chain of thought, reasoning. I prepare a very short video. It's very good. What were the major differences between ChatGPT and GPT-4? that led to its improvements in these in these areas? So GPT-4 is a pretty substantial improvement on top of chat GPT across very many dimensions. We trained GPT-4, I would say, between more than six months ago, maybe eight months ago, I don't remember exactly. GPT, the first few big difference between chat GPT and GPT-4 and that's perhaps is the more, the most important difference, is that the base on top of GPT-4 is built, predicts the next word with greater accuracy. This is really important because the better the neural network can predict the next word in text, the more it understands it. This claim is now perhaps accepted by many at this point, but it might still not be intuitive or not completely intuitive as to why that is. I'd like to take a small detour and to give an analogy that can hopefully clarify why more accurate prediction of the next word leads to more understanding, real understanding. Let's consider an example. Say you read a detective novel. It's like a complicated plot, storyline, different characters, lots of events, mysteries like clues, it's unclear. Then, 
let's say that at the last page of the book, the detective has gathered all the clues, gathered all the people, and then, okay, I'm going to reveal the identity of whoever committed the crime. And that person's name is... Predict that word. Predict that word. Yeah. Exactly. My goodness. Right? Yeah, right. Now, there are many different words, but by predicting those words better and better and better, the understanding of the text keeps on increasing. What were the major differences? I love this because for this tale of secret, reasoning, lawyer, our best is the reasoning, right? The law school will learn how to reason and change the thought, the creator. I'm using that because I put on the case, all the files, load them up, asking the chat GPT, give an answer. Okay. This is the, the format is very easy. You put a question here, I give you the answers. Two very good legal a, a GPT is created. One is a Stanford law graduate. His text is already acquired by Tom's, Tom's Reuters for $600 million. And this one is interesting. Everybody using that is use this kind of interface. But yesterday, the Sam released the turbo. You are changing so quickly. I just finished the work. Yesterday, kind of make a, a new announcement, turbo. Turbo, you don't have to do the coding. You talk to the chat. They give you a lot of different things. Here, you load it on the files. Here, look here. Amazing. All the files, they came to the uh, 50 pages, maybe longer, maybe 100 pages. Put it on all your files, uh, application, statement of defense, evidence, you load it on. You start asking questions, asking questions. You see, the, what is the governing law? This is the Georgia law. They pull out for all the files. You ask all the questions. They give you the answer. And they also tell the key issues, drag it on, who the party is and produce the last page of the prediction of the case before the tribunal, really. And this is my <laughs> invention. Okay, uh, sorry, Chinese. We know that all the cases here, the time is limited. I cannot give a, give a, a demo show. It's very interesting. I put all the pumps because the pumps is very, very important. The clear pump give you a clear answer, okay? Okay, I, I asked the, my system, please give me a SCIC arbitration application template. Click this button, give you all. They can do lots of things, doing legal research very quickly. And they can answer all the questions. Okay, and everything about the SCIC procedures whatsoever. I'm choosing a suitable arbitrator. This is a big hassle. They have 100 people on my on, on the list. Who is the best for this case? This is a maritime law case. They tell you because we put all the person's name there and put on the case. They tell you who are the most suitable arbitrator for the clients. Okay, attracting the facts and dispute issues. I love it because just like that show. Okay, give all the files. They tell you the two. They tell you the, the, the you know the disputes and summary. And the translating the documents is so easy because when, you know, I say, I say to you, form the case, they have to translate, lots of money. Here, it's one minute translation. That's before the TGTP I created for SSA. It's very hard because I have to do lots of things manually. Right now, we don't need it. I can load on my, you know, this is my robot, put it on here. Yeah, this is a, a, the first arbitration robot using by SCIC six years ago. <laughs> Probably uh, in China have 200 arbitration institutions. No one has been using that. I don't know in US or other countries. Uh, answer lots of questions. When secretary out of work, my robot answer all the arbitration questions. Okay, uh, I have a real one here waiting if you go with military it's a Office, they're always standing there welcoming you. Okay, and uh, we do a lot of uh, 
a seminar. Uh, I did a seminar uh, last month uh, in their beautiful office. How can you use that? I will talk quickly because you have to pray training. Very important. If you do, do, do the pre training, fine tuning, they give the answer is not right. Sounds like a good, good answer, but actually it's not true. And then data processing, we have to collect all the data, but artificial information is confidential. I cannot get the information. That's my difficult thing. We need to, I hope we can change the arbitration law to allow people just like Chinese court to release you know, the, the arbitration award. Because of the data confidentiality, data security, we have to do a private deployment of the large model as an office, very expensive. Benefits and challenges, very efficient, time saving. We talk about the, you know, the online or electronic. This this one is amazing. And accuracy, trans consistency. You have to be careful. You have to do, do the pre-training and lots of other things. And cost effective because one case only a few minutes, maybe one day finished. You don't have to drag on for years and clients save money and economy getting, you know, moving ahead. Enhance the legal research, very quickly do legal research. And finally, it's the predicting and judging. This is my last, last part of the, the GTP. Uh, I gave the case, I say, tell me what's the key issue of that case. Tell me other parties' strategy. They give you, they know, you know other parties' strategy easily. Because when I have a case, uh, the other party always try to delay to give the statement of defense. You don't have to worry right now. You say, for this case, tell me the defense, uh, statement of defense, they tell you. That may be better than other party prepared. Don't give it to them, okay? <laughs> Challenges, confidentiality, data privacy, accuracy, uh, discrimination from algorithm and the data, because lots of data have discrimination things, okay? Okay, the guidelines, I will do very quickly. Just follow that, okay? I don't want to read it anymore, okay? Conclusion, uh, application of ChatGTP application, not, not just critical technology, it's a safeguard guarding the principle of justice and fairness. Okay, we have to, we are facing serious challenges such as confidentiality, privacy, ethics, uh, host, host, you know, whole situation, you know, that, like that. As we're moving forward, it's very important we strike a balance between the benefits and challenges, ensure the te technology augments the human expertise rather than replace it. Finally, I hope SAIC can be a palette for application of ChatGDP in international arbitration and promote successful experiments in China and internationally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Li Xing. I think uh, above all, you have explained and told us how hot the topic was. And I think in the room here in Hong Kong, we're experiencing a slight temperature rise in the room. These things has uh, kindly offered to maybe because of due to the nature of the topic to take maybe one or two questions from the floor. So if you would like to volunteer to ask questions, please let me know. Uh, if I don't see any hands raised instantaneously, I think due to the time constraint, I will just go to the next uh, speaker. But uh, uh, I have a quick question. Please. Uh, mainly because uh, just to reply to you, you did ask SCIA to uh, be the pioneer to try using chatbot. Uh, just a couple of questions because I've also given, I just recently given a, a 
a presentation on how AI may affect arbitration and mediation and would it replace, you know, human arbitrators. Um, I've done some research. It seems that a lot of jurisdictions, they simply do not allow AI in decision. In the Netherlands, they actually say, if anything is decided by AI, would not be enforced, right? Although there are other jurisdictions, like Tur Turkey, they actually quite accept that. But more importantly, when it comes to arbitration, uh, a lot of questions raised. Number one, unnatural rules never, 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 never contemplate you have AI arbitrator. Uh, so, because it says that, uh, for example, uh, okay, I used to know the rules very well, but I don't want to show up here. Anyway, one of the rules say that due to incapacity of uh, an arbitrator uh, because of illness or death of arbitrator, you should do this, you should do that. So that means it must be a human arbitrator because AI arbitrator cannot die and will not fall in ill, right? Do you agree? That's one thing. And number two, there is also another um, big question. Can we enforce an arbitration award made by a uh, and the New York Convention? The New York Convention contemplate arbitration award made by AI. What, what do you think of all these questions? Okay. Thank you so much. I know they have a, uh, every time after my presentation, questions always come to me. Yeah. So then the question told me, do you want the audience to give a question? Of course, I get used to it. Uh, very interesting. All the Beijing and the Shenzhen law firm are very open to using that. But the only firm in Beijing, I don't want to use the name, you tell you the name. The management committee said, no, no, we don't want to do, we don't want our lawyer to use ChatGTP. This is the only, only law firm. And uh, New York Convention, many years ago, things are changing so quickly. So the law are changed to follow up, to scope up with the technology development. Uh, nobody, I think the chat GTP will not replace anyone. They will not replace anyone. They are just a tool to provide you, give you a hand. Everybody using a tool. If you use a tool, you work more efficient. But the arbitrator has the liability if you using the ChatGTP to judging the case, you have to tell, this is my rule, okay? You have to tell the CIC committee. You say, this case, I will use ChatGTP, first one. You have to tell. And the party, it's a, my friend already using that. I told them before you go to the court, go to the arbitration tribunal, you have to raise your hand. Tell them I'm using that already. Because in New York, this this lawyer using pull out the case and the judge very smart. They found this case not existing. Penalize this law firm and this lawyer. Penalty. Right, right. But interesting, interestingly, I like the US court because they are very open-minded. They are not banned using the chat GDP rather than put a notice say, if everybody goes to the court to use chat, you have to inform the court. That's it. I like it. The California, New York, Texas, all the court, a lot of lawyers are using that. I'm sure the judge by using that. If the young judge, definitely, because the law school, everybody using that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, law school, they all use everybody. That. Some U.S. law firm say no, but <laughs> they go home because they save them a whole lot of time. They don't have to work burn the midnight oil to do a one case. That would be stupid. They just go ahead and do it. One thing, if you use it, you send the paper, okay? It's not the chat GTP's liability. It's the arbitrator. It's the judge. It's the lawyer's liability. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Lee Sing. <laughs> and we'll leave it there. To Hong Kong, you lecture us. Hong Kong, you uh, as a last um, allow students to do it, right? You did think a bit longer than the other two because but eventually you decided to allow it. Can you? Yeah, yeah, I'll give you an example. We're t in the arbitration law. Uh, we have a midterm assessment. Some I see some of our students are LLM here, so it's really yeah. nice. Yeah, <laughs> wow, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Welcome. So you know the assessment, right? We ask them, use chat GPT to write uh, a memorandum, but then you check it. 
you do this, so you do the review, you yeah. you ensure the via, the uh, the veracity of the citations, you give comments and see how to improve it, see where it's correct, where it's incorrect. So this is now what we're trying to do, and it's an experiment in our course. So we'll see how the students like it, because we know it's there, and we can't avoid it, and we can't just uh, blind ourselves to it. So we have to engage somehow proactively, but also recognize liability and uh, sort of the responsibility still lies with us as, as a legal practitioner, and we have to take responsibility for the work. Uh, not to digress, uh, um, I can't uh, tell you, I the other university that you probably know that the chairman of the copyright tribunal for the Cambridge, so I just finished my term, but I've been asked to, to, to look into the possibility that can someone own the copyright of your idea or chat all the Right. This is very interesting uh, topic. Why don't you spend some time and I'll give you my name and share with you. Okay, we then now proceed to Shala. Okay. Yeah, please. I think you will should proceed to the podium and you will be discussing for us opportunities and safeguards and the use of technology in arbitration and Charles ERDE project. So you, your discussion will be a, hopefully be a great wrap up for a discussion. Oh, there is, uh, this is so exciting. Lishing's uh, presentation, very hard to match your energy. I, I don't know what I can do. I, I can't do much, but I will. Uh, okay. Oh, so it doesn't connect here to. I see. So, but this one is not the same. Okay. Never mind. That's okay. Ah, okay. So, never mind. That's okay. I will turn my head a little bit. I'm sorry because I don't have the same in both sides. But I'm going to just share a little bit about um, sort of the use, some of the issues that are maybe p potentially arising in the use of online technology for virtual hearings and uh, reporting on some recent cases that are probably familiar to you um, from our own jurisdiction here. So um, these cases may help us to think about the potential safeguards that um, Ansutra is looking at. And first, I'd like to congratulate Ansutra and SCIA for hosting this very dynamic and forward-looking uh, session. So thank you very much for putting this together and also for inviting us and such a, a really wonderful array of speakers today. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit, and I think my colleague, uh, Professor Zhao Yun, mentioned that there's been a real impetus with COVID. Uh, we've all moved, we've had to move online. This has really uh, necessitated a steep learning curve. We've really uh, increased our knowledge and understanding of how to use uh, virtual hearings. Um, and many of us have done this. Um, and so there's also been an increase rather than a decrease in arbitral applications. So also the Shenzhen Court of uh, South China Arbitration Commission, also HKIC, they've all seen an increase uh, over the period of COVID uh, in terms of cases. It hasn't slowed down. So we see that other means have been used to uh, help parties proceed and access their resolution through through these online um, tools. Okay, so there are many tools and I won't go through all of them, but we are probably most familiar with Zoom, but there are other tools which are uh, being used, including WebEx, uh, Teams, BlueJeans, these are all other team, uh, 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 tools which have been developed. Um, and all the major arbitral centers, including SCIA, have developed uh, guidelines and advice to parties about using these tools. Um, okay. Oh, so what are some of the issues? So UNCITRAL, I think, has in its own model law, I think, really lays out very clearly what are the principles that we should apply in our arbitration proceedings, whether it's virtual or it's in person. And those guidelines, those principles are very clear and very helpful. And I think they've helped to develop the field of international arbitration to where it is now, where parties respect the outcome, they feel heard, and they feel that they've had, um, uh, they've been treated with fairness. And so the idea is how to think then, how to apply those same principles in a virtual context, because I think the principles are very well laid out. Um, fairness, uh, you know, the full opportunity to be heard, both parties fair and equal treatment, um, all of these principles have been uh, articulated. Um, so, for example, having an opportunity to prevent, present your evidence, 
um, that the arbitrator itself is fair, the arbitrator itself feels is impartial, independent. Um, Li, uh, Li Xing was mentioning the bias in AI. So um, this is a concern. How do we check the AI generated text if we are going to use it, make sure that it's uh, referencing a wide array. It doesn't have, you know, checking for those built-in biases is another um, question that we'll need to explore. Um, okay, so many of you have heard about a recent case in Hong Kong. This is the Song Li Hua case versus Li Qi. This is very recent. Um, Judge Mimi Chan heard this case. Um, okay, I'm going backwards. Okay, okay. So what was this case? Uh, many of you can recite the facts. So this was a case that was brought for enforcement in Hong Kong. And the for, uh, court of first instance was dealing with this application to set aside a award that was issued by the Chengdu Arbitration Commission. Um, and so during the proceedings, it was found that this arbitrator was chatting, was not having the mic on, was talking on the phone, doing other things, uh, appeared in wandering in rooms, talking to other people. So clearly not... Um, you know, applying the principles that we're familiar with in the, you know, do, you know, parties have a fair equal opportunity to be heard, that, to present their evidence and for that evidence to be considered by the tribunal. Um, so it, Judge Mimi Chan said that under this uh, arbitration ordinance, section 46, the parties have to be treated equally, meaning that their, their case has to be heard properly. Um, and so it's also that it can be a set aside if enforcing it would be contrary to public policy. And so looking at this evidence, Judge Chen agreed that there was uh, sufficient evidence to show the arbitrator's conduct vitiated the principle of fairness and the award was set aside. So this is a, a warning to us as arbitrator practitioner. We can't just, you know, I know we do it on Zoom. We're like, oh, okay, multitask a hundred things. You know, we have meetings, we, but in the proceeding, this has to be your full attention. Um, it's not like, you know, we we have students, our students also are on the Zoom both directions. We know they're doing a hundred things as well when they're listening to us. I assume that, I assume that there are 20 things open. I have a daughter, 15 years old. I know her computer, what it looks like when she was in the online school. So we all are used to this kind of multitasking um, uh, habit. But I think this is a very good example that that's not a habit we can bring in the arbitration proceeding. This is still like the same as in a room, full attention is, is uh, the standard. So this is a good case, I think, to illustrate how important that is and that uh, case uh, that uh, awards can be set aside um, if parties find that this has not been uh, complied with. Okay, so... Um, Okay, but at the same time, we know that a fully virtual hearing is not a problem by itself. So having a fully virtual hearing, of course, has been affirmed in multiple cases throughout the world, including here in this uh, Asia Pacific region. Many uh, courts have uh, enforced awards that have been fully virtual, um, and it doesn't mean that there is anything problematic about that in itself. Um, there's another case that we, um, so Sky Power was one of these where uh, the court of first instance uh, first refused an application to um, set aside an award because they were held fully online, but then this was uh, later overturned. Um, remote proceedings don't impact the fairness in themselves, even if there were difficulties, they were suffered equally by the parties. Uh, remote hearings are commonplace in court proceedings arbitrations before the pandemic and more so after it. And so basically it's saying that the hearing by itself being virtual is not uh, enough to set aside an award. Okay, the last case I'll mention is one in the US. So the US court was actually asked to uh, determine whether uh, an award could be recognized uh, or deny the enforcement of an award. And this was due to one of the parties uh, failure to attend the hearing. Uh, what happened in this case, this was a Hong Kong case, uh, an option for virtual attendance was provided to the party, and the party didn't take up that uh, option and didn't attend. And so therefore, the party couldn't use the excuse that he had, it was impossible to uh, participate as a, a reason to deny the enforcement of the award. The Texas court said you had an opportunity, even though it was virtual, it was an opportunity uh, to participate in the proceeding and did not deny the enforcement of this award. So this is cited in a book that we just 
uh, finished on the ancestral model law. It's a commentary, and I hope <laughs> to give a copy later. Um, but it, it it compiles cases from around the world um, in multiple jurisdictions, looking at how courts have really um, implemented uh, the model law and how they've tried to understand its application. Okay, so safeguards that's what we're going to talk about so i'm going to let you ask the questions but i really did uh, have a chance to have a preview of some of Unsitral's early thinking about um, the use of video conferencing and i think it's entirely on the right track um, looking at what are the potential areas um, um, so there's the stop taking of developments and dispute resolution in the dig digital economy which i think everyone will have perhaps some access to or a discussion about. Um, and this stock taking is a really great exercise. And I guess we're part of the stock taking here, uh, as are many regions. And this is something I admire so much about Unsitral is how grounded it is in receiving and giving feedback and uh, such an important dialogue process. So um, so some of these the issues that were mentioned before about privacy, confidentiality, uh, technical limitations, these are addressed in the stop taking. Um, and um, sorry, I will go back. Um, I will just say to summarize that, you know, there is uh, essentially a new a new world we're in. And I think Li Xing has really <laughs> skillfully and also Professor Zhao Yun, you know, laid the foundation for our understanding that we're in a new terrain. And so we're in a very unique opportunity to learn how to use it well. It can really potentially accelerate our efficiency and access to justice for parties and uh, reduce costs. There are many potential benefits, but we have to make sure that we use them ethically, wisely, with principle, and we apply those same principles we do in the physical hearing uh, to these online spaces. And I'm happy to share and discuss a few of these safeguards you know, in our conversation. Thank you so much, Shalom. So yes, I would really love to continue on with the discussion, but maybe perhaps if I can, in the remaining time, ask you one question. Um, you mentioned the important principles and the guidance that is embedded in the Ancestral text. And I know that you have participated in Ancestral's work in the past. And given your familiarity, I would like to hear from you, because this is an exercise to gather thoughts about next steps, uh, uh, how safeguards could be put in place in this uh, that are suitable for the digital age in the field of dispute resolution, please. Yeah. Should I just start? Oh, okay. Thank you so much. I think one of the important principles in Ancitral is the fair and equal treatment of parties. And um, I think that uh, you have in the safeguards, you know, some discussion about video conferencing and how we can ensure fair and equal treatment in the video conferencing context. And I'll just give a few examples of some recent experiences, because I also do take some arbitration cases, uh, especially during COVID. I know from colleagues, you know, the third video is one tool people use to ensure that there's no witness coaching. I just saw A Guilty Conscience, the Hong Kong film. I don't know how many saw it. Uh, it's a really fun film. It's about a Hong Kong court case. But there was all kinds of coaching going on in the back, signs, you know, uh, trying to instruct the witness to answer in a certain way. So that third video is to ensure that that uh, witness is not being um, sort of guided in any way. And I think that that's very useful. People have, I've heard law firms have actually sent people to physically watch people in the room, but that's very expensive. So finding ways to do this. Another one is um, we think about Zoom. Zoom has, so we, private caucusing is not allowed in arbitration. We can't have direct communication between one party and the arbitrator in the absence of the others. This is unfair. So some, something I was thinking recently, Zoom, you have direct chat function. Maybe we need to disable that. You know, we don't want to have one party writing to the arbitrator without the other party's knowledge in the video conferencing setting. So maybe we have to uh, create a function where for arbitrations, it's only group chat or no chat, uh, because otherwise people could have direct lines without the possibility of due process or challenging what one person is saying to the tribunal. So this is another thought. The third thing which came up in arbitration was uh, sometimes parties don't show up or they don't represent themselves, uh, but they 
we need to give them access to the hearing as well. So we've uh, recorded them. We say, okay, for those who are here pre-hearing conference, we're going to set the schedule. We will record the entire conversation and make it available to you, the counterparty on um, on Zoom or in the cloud, so you can see uh, everything that was discussed and so that they feel that they have been part of that process and can raise any issues if they wish um, and not feel that they've been denied their opportunity. So these are some examples, um, but I, I really like what you've developed so far. Um, also in terms of confidentiality, privacy, ensuring that the parties uh, maintain that confidentiality, which is the reason they've sought arbitration in the first place. So well done to the UNSA trial and to SCIA, and I appreciate being being part of the conversation. Thank you so much, Shala. I have many, many more questions, but uh, we will have to stop here. And But this is an ongoing project uh, process, as you say, so we will continue our dialogue with you, the other speakers, and also with those participating here and also online, everyone who is interested in the project, we continue with our dialogue. Uh, I would just like to thank all the speakers again, and I would like to ask um, everyone to join me in thanking the million dollar speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, all the speakers. Uh, I think that brings uh, us to the end of this program. I, I believe that all of you have a great time of listening to our speakers today, sharing their insights on the uh, digitalization in the dispute resolution, in particular, the application of technology and its impact in international arbitration. On behalf of the co-organizers of this event, I want to express our gratitude to all the speakers and guests who present in this room online, uh, on site and online. And a special thanks to the Ansui Trial for considering uh, choosing Hong Kong and Shenzhen as the place to hold this event. As the technology center in, in China, uh, Shenzhen is the te technological center in China, and Hong Kong is the China's uh, the Asia Pacific hub for dispute resolution and legal service. I think both of the cities are capable of contributing to the policy initiatives uh, in this area. And SA and SA Hong Kong and our other partners in this region, we're sideways on CHO to reflect and respond uh, to the challenges from this rapidly changing time. And uh, 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 I, I, I hope to see you all uh, soon in our future events. Uh, thank you all. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. I invite all the speakers and take a group picture again. Thank you.